Hello, I hope you can all hear me. My name is Alison Toombs and I'm um, an Assistant Director for Assessment and Wellbeing for North Tyneside North Council. Council. Can people hear me? Yeah, OK. Um, we're a group of people from the Heads of Service team, um, Heads of Service from the North East ADAS. Um, we are, we work together to, to look at the issues around defensible decision making. So I'd just like to introduce my colleagues, though they probably won't be on screen just yet. Um, well, Lynn Beavis there um, is the Principal Social Worker Hello. in Middlesbrough and Jonathan Jameson is Head of Service in Newcastle. And we're also joined by Steph Downey um, from Gateshead, Margaret Carney from Sunderland and Angela Connor from Stockton. Um, myself and Jonathan and Lynn will be presenting and um, and Steph and Margaret and um, Angela will be supporting us as we move into breakout rooms later in the session, as we'll all have the opportunity to discuss what we're what we're talking about here. So you'll have the opportunity to contribute. And what I would say is if you could contribute, that will make it much more fuller session for everybody. So learning from all of our experiences over this past year in terms of how we've worked in our social work practice, particularly in these trying times. Um, we hope you enjoy this session. We hope you contribute. We are going to be using uh, PowerPoint and um, we've also got a film to, to give you some feedback on how we've, how we've used this, um, this tool. Just in theme, the theme is a virtual visits and the theme is around um, defensible decision making. But we just took that theme a little bit further. So we've used our PowerPoint to bring you on a virtual visit of the northeast of England. So all of your PowerPoints, you'll see lots of photographs of the beautiful northeast. And we hope you enjoy, you'll enjoy your virtual visit as well as the content of the actual kind of workshop. Uh, could we bring the PowerPoint up now and I'll hand over to Jonathan to, to start the presentation. Yes, indeed. Just um, find that for you now. There we are, over to you. Thank you. So as Alison said, um, my name's Jonathan Jameson. I'm Head of Service for Adult Social Care at Newcastle City Council. Um, and the presentation is a Defensible Decision Making Tool. Are you OK just to scroll that on, please? So basically, we're going to take you through a very brief presentation and, and that will look at why we thought it was important to, to pull this tool together, what it actually is, how we've actually implemented it across the region, and um, future steps, as, as Alison said, about sort of using technology going forward. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about future steps with regards to this. We'll then have the, the, the group discussion in the, the small breakout rooms and then come back to close. Uh, thank you. If you could move that on again, please. So really, uh, I guess before March last year, uh, I think it would be fair to say that the majority of the work that we were involved in was a sort of person to person in terms of meeting with people who maybe use our services, their families, carers and, and other professionals and organisations. Um, we have had access to technology, but probably didn't use it to its full potential in, in previous sort of years. Um, and maybe it's not as often as we, as we possibly could. Um, so during the pandemic, we, we've had to use sort of very different ways of working and, and had to use that technology to make contact with people um, in very different ways. So we recognise that our social work staff were having to provide support. And I know everybody's mentioned it so far today in what has been a really challenging 12 months on top of the, the role itself being challenging um, in itself. And I guess during that first lockdown, uh, the guidance we were receiving and which was being provided to us um, was being, I guess, used in different ways by different employers. So, you know, we, we were conscious that people were, um, were being provided with guidance, but it was being interpreted in different ways. Are you OK to move that on, please? Thank you. So I guess quite quickly we had a workforce that was told to work from home where that was at all possible. 
um, and a lot of local authorities were providing advice and guidance and making recommendations on, I guess, the use of technology where possible as an alternative to that sort of physical meeting with people. Um, and, and that was for a number of reasons. That was not necessarily just visiting people in their own homes, but I guess inviting people into office spaces um, to meet up and sort of talk and, and be involved in, in sort of conversations and meetings ab about support and, and the way that things were for them. So this was in addition to an awful lot of guidance that was being received by the government, uh, Social Work England were providing guidance, BASWA, and, and I guess other organisations were also providing that. I guess what we thought it meant in practice was that some assessments and reviews and contacts with people were taking place in many different ways. So, you know, we had the use of the telephone, Zoom calls, WhatsApp, Teams, um, and, and I think it was just an acknowledgement that there were a number of different ways that we were getting in contact with people. Are you okay just to move that on again, please? Thank you. I guess staff adapted to this in, in very different ways of working and um, were offering different options that I guess, you know, we hadn't really tried previously. So technology was offered and it was offering more choice to people. So not only were we in a position where we were, so I guess in some respects, forced into using different ways of working, actually, in some respects, it was offering alternatives that, you know, in some areas we hadn't used or chosen to use in, in this way. Um, as Alison said, as a group of heads of service um, in the Northeast, um, I guess what we decided to do was to, is to bring together some of the conversations that we were having, some of the observations, that we'd um, been provided with and, and some of the feedback that we'd received sort of from our staff. Um, and, you know, much of the conversation was about how we could support staff to use different options that were available to them, I guess, to help make decisions about the most appropriate way of, of I guess, making contact with people that they were working with. I guess we pooled the guidance uh, that we've been using across the different areas. And, and, and what we decided to do was to, to come up with, with a tool that we thought we could use um, to support people. Are you OK to move that on, please? Thank you. So I guess the, the, we called it a defensible decision making tool. And that, in some respects, that was about acknowledging that um, we do need to be aware that, you know, any decisions that we make, we need to be able to confirm why we've done the things that we've done in the ways that we we do them so the the making the tool yeah, i guess as simple as possible was something that we wanted to do um so it, it, it it's formed into sort of a simple risk assessment tool i guess to help and support social work staff to consider the type of visit that may be required or the type of meeting that may be required with a person um and you know that would depend on on different circumstances and I guess, you know, how it was felt that the, the person needed to make contact. Um, the questions are to help staff sort of weigh up uh, whether or not they need to have that sort of physical contact, face to face meeting with a person or whether they can use those alternatives. Uh, and I guess the pro forma asks for, I guess, the rationale for making that decision to be clarified and to be recorded. And if you could just move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. I guess the next two slides really are just to show you um, the, um, the tool as it is. Um, if you could move on to the next slide, please. So really, it, it, it's just a, a list of questions for the social work staff to, to go through and, and I guess to, to consider you know, what it is they're, they're thinking about, uh, the, the tool sort of asks the person to, to think about their comments, and then it provides a bit of a, a risk um, sort of rating that would allow the, the social work staff to, you know, think about um, whether or not, you know, the area that they're thinking about in terms of uh, meeting up with the person requires them to think any more about uh, whether or not that needs to be um, that sort of you know, face to face or physical contact with that person or whether it can be uh, the use of technology. Context of this is really important as I guess in the first lockdown in, in many cases the default felt like it was not to visit people 
Uh, and that was based on sort of public health England guidance, which was telling us all um, to protect each other and to protect other people we were coming into contact with. And that was about trying to reduce um, the spread of the virus. So, you know, I think our view when that first lockdown was that some people were maybe, you know, thinking about the decision they were making in a slightly different way because of that unknown nature of, of whether or not, you know, the use of things like PPE was sufficient in terms of supporting them um, with the work that they needed to do. Are you OK to move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, and I guess this was a major part of what we were trying to, to debate and, and think about, you know, when we were looking at whether or not we needed to, to meet up with a person. Um, and I guess, you know, the, as I said, the questions there are just to get the person who's looking at this to think about the reason behind the, you know, the, the fact that we've been contacted. Is it somebody we already know? Is it somebody brand new? Does that change? you know, whether or not we need to see the person in their own environment or whether we can just use some technology to be involved in that process. Um, the, the tool here, and this is the final page of the tool, is really just at the end is trying to get the person who's completing the tool to just think about whether or not they believe that uh, a visit is required um, and if so, to give some rationale for that decision. And similarly, if not, just to provide um, some rationale around why they've come to that conclusion. Not an onerous tool. We deliberately made it um, look like this and to, to sort of not to feel like it was burdensome in terms of trying to get people to think about these questions and to, um, and to come to that sort of conclusion. That's the last bit that I'm going to do. So I'm going to hand over now to Lynn Beavers, if that's OK. So uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Jonathan. That, that's great. Um, my name's Lynn Beavers and I'm the Principal Social Worker for Adults in Middlesbrough. And I'd like to talk today about the implementation of the form and how it's been used. And the, the defensible decision making tool has been welcomed across the North East region. And it's been implemented in a variety of ways, with assessment staff being encouraged to use the tool to help inform their decision making when deciding whether to undertake a face-to-face -face visit. The form's really versatile and can be used with a variety of customer groups and their carers. Next slide, please. And I want to talk about how we introduced the form in Middlesbrough um, and the experiences that our staff have had. And the tool was implemented for use by in Middlesbrough by staff undertaking assessments across adult social care, including social workers, social care workers, AMPS, and also our finance staff. And we made the tool available across all client groups, including older people, people with physical disabilities, people with learning disabilities, and people with dementia as well. Next slide. And it's really important that we share the information with our assessors. And Middlesbrough's current guidance and risk assessments around COVID advised staff only to visit face to face when it was essential to do so, making full use of PPE in order to minimise risk. However, staff sometimes find it difficult to decide, to decide when a visit is essential or not and whether alternative methods could be used to gather the information needed. So we had an awful lot of discussions around the purpose and benefits of using the tool. And this included discussions at virtual management meetings, discussions at virtual team meetings, guidance notes emailed directly to our staff and training around how to utilise and record the tool. And also ongoing discussions with assessors about how the tool is being used. And this enabled assessors to understand how this could help them to weigh up the risks associated with visiting or not visiting our customers. Next slide. So I think it's really important how we recorded the defensible decision tool and we made the decision to enable our staff to upload the tool onto our electronic record system. And this enabled staff to record a decision so that we could call it up later on if needed to see, to look back and have evidence. So 
I've included a snapshot there of what the, what the form actually looks like on our LAS system. And it's um, attached within the service user's client record, so it's easily accessible. Um, and there's lots of drop down boxes. So we adjusted the form a little so that if, if staff wanted to make comments or add additional information, they can do. Next slide, please. So using the tool, we introduced the tool in, um, in December last year and teams started to use the form pretty much straight away. And they used it when they were considering if they needed to do a face-to-face -face visit and whether or not that was essential or not. Um, and that may include assessments, reviews, or any other circumstances where a visit may be required, for example, following a safeguarding concern. And the tool is not mandatory for all situations. We were very mindful of not giving people extra work to do um, when it wasn't required. And the tool does not replace discussions and guidance from your manager, um, which is very, very important to say. It's just so that if we need to, we can look back and it's a mechanism for people to actually put something down on paper and, and have the thinking out in front of them to help them decide. Next slide, please. So as, as part of the ongoing monitoring and, and development of the form, we continue to seek feedback from the people who are using it. And feedback's been positive so far, and our assessors feel reassured that there is a tool available so that they can demonstrate their reasoning and decision making. And David, one of our mental health social workers, told me that there have been numerous times over the last year during COVID-19 when he felt in a double bind to visit or not visit a service user given the risk of not going balanced against the risk of going and he feels that the tool has helped him to legitimize his decision making and given needed reassurance in this regard but we've also prepared a short film incorporating feedback from across the region
And back to the slides. So um, I believe, Lynn, it's over to Alison next. It is, yes. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed the little tour. I'm, I, I, I don't know about you, but some of the words weren't quite there because there was a little block in the um, in the bottom of the of the, of the, show, sorry, um, the screen. So apologies for that. Um, I'm hoping that we might be able to share it, or at least share the, um, the recording, so people might be able to see it at another time. So in terms of the um, the next step, so just when we get the PowerPoint up, really I'm going to be starting to look at the future and what that means for us in terms of how we take this work forward as we move beyond COVID and, and hopefully to something in terms of a, a new normal as people are talking about. Have we got the PowerPoint yet? Oh, is it not on your screen? Apologies. No, not yet. That's OK. OK, it's, it's usually the, uh, the IT that's a bit glitchy. Bear with me and I will reproduce them. Thanks. Just, just while Kate's getting that, um, just in terms of COVID, I mean, I think it's important to, to remember to the next slide. So it's important to remember in, in terms of thinking about the impact that COVID has had on our lives in many ways, and, and that's personal as well as our professional lives. And I think it's important that we, we remember um, just, just how many people have been affected by this, how many people have tragically lost their lives. Just wanted to take a moment to, to reflect on the, that, that fact, but also the, the huge amount of input that all of our social care staff have had to support people throughout this time. I think it's been a huge effort and, and really respectful that we thank people on that basis. But it has changed the way that we work and it's changed um, the way that we, we think about the work that we do. In terms of the way we work, often when you ask somebody why they do something, the answer will always be, don't really think about it, it's how we've always done it, um, and it's just what we do. So in terms of visits, I know in our area it's very much we go out and visit people, or we did. Um, when you actually think about it, you really have to you have to kind of stop and think and think, well, why do we do that? Um, and something like this pandemic has really made us think about that and made us think about the way that we work. It's um, it's made us um, change the way that we've done and, and sometimes things that you would normally take a long, long time to change any kind of particular practice. We've had a bit of a revolution and actually we had to implement new things pretty much overnight. So we have had to change and it hasn't been a choice, but then we can think about how we learn from that. So in terms of how that helps us to make the decisions that we make, we think about the rationale for our decision making and this tool is effectively helping you to put your rationale down on paper to give a give a kind of a principle in terms of what you've actually done and why you've done it so it's very much as jonathan said it's based on risk assessment there is no right or wrong answer it's the information that you had at the time and it's it's how you've processed that information to come to a conclusion um, and it's able to articulate how you've made that decision so it's very much um, based on the information and as Jonathan always kind of looked through it, it's information from other people. It's, it's sometimes safeguarding information. It might be conflicting information from different people um, and it's known conflicts or it, those are the things that might make you more concerned about a situation. So the reasons why you might end up going out on a home visit because you've got differing information or you've got information from different people telling you different things or there's a risk around safeguarding. So that will impact on um, how we um, how we actually make our decisions and the people that we support. And we've seen the feedback that you've, we've just shown you from a variety of people in that film. It was both positive and negative. Some people, this this virtual visits is, is a really positive way of working. It's really beneficial to people and other people. It's de more detrimental. Um, and we need to ensure that we work with people in a way that suits them best but also that we learn from the past year and we shouldn't just go back to how we did things as they were before. Could we go to the next slide? Thank you. So in terms of the future, social work isn't about technology, it is about people, but actually we need to harness that technology to support how we connect with people in the future and what will that look like? A year on, we need to reflect on this and think through what can we learn when we talk about post-COVID, many people are using words like reset, rebuild and recover. And I think we need to think about, we need to learn and evolve. Um, we can do things differently. We know that based on the last year's experience. But for some people, that this way of working will suit them well and it can be more efficient. It can mean that people are more in control of their lives and care and support can fit in around them. 
it, for other people, it's been more difficult, and that could be because maybe they're not feeling confident using technology, or they don't have or they don't have access to the uh, to the IT equipment or to infrastructure. So there is no one size fits all, and it's um, it's it's really the other side of things we need to think about is our staff as well. Some of our staff will be desperate to go out on home visits again, and some of our staff may may never want to go out on another home visit again, and doing everything online. So we have a balancing act to to take it forward. There's no one size fits all, and we need to think about how we come to some hybrid solutions, and we, we need to work out what we've been doing and how we move forward. So virtual visits will become a part of the way we work in future. There are many benefits that we've seen, but it's not saying that that will be the only way that we'll work. We need to have clear decision making for when we do and don't see people face to face. And we need to make sure that that decision making is based on the fact, using the information we know at the time, and making sure that we've got informed decisions about the best outcome for that person and for our staff. We're wanting now to move into some breakout rooms, so to take you across and to have a short discussion um, for you to be involved in those discussions about what you've done in your area, what learning you've done, and then how, how, you, how you've taken things forward um, and how you're thinking about the future for your particular areas. So I think we've got six breakout rooms, um, and as I said before, Jonathan, Lynn and myself will be leading them alongside Steph, Margaret and Angela. Um, so we'll have about 10 minutes in the breakout room and then we'll have a um, chance to come back to feedback to as a bigger group in terms of some of that learning. So by the magic of this technology, I think Kate's going to send us off into ah, our, into our well, breakout rooms. Yes, yes. Um, I was about to talk about the magic of the technology. So this um, exercise here with the breakout rooms does take just ever just like one minute's time. So while I'm organising people into rooms, I just wonder whether Alison, you could just just expand a little bit on on some of the content of the film that was shared because there were some really interesting comments there made by social workers. Could you could you elaborate a little bit on the content that you ob obtained for that? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, we asked social workers, A, how they felt about using the form, and people generally had very positive um, feelings of using the form. It was a way of um, enabling people to, um, to to come to a conclusion about whether they should or shouldn't go out on a visit, weighing up the information that they had. Then we asked people generally how they how they found using um, actual visits, and that was interesting. We had we had some real positives. So information sharing was better. Multi agency attendance at meetings is better, um, and and people finding that some people, particularly perhaps people with autism, kind of really like the technology and and found that a much better way of communicating with people. But we also had some negatives, so people feeling that they had no time in between meetings, so constantly going from one team's meeting to another, you don't have the opportunity to um, to think about, you know, the, the, what you've what you've been talking about or process that information, because you, you normally you'd have time in your car or time in the office to kind of to work through what what you've actually need to do to support that person. Jumping from team to call to team call is 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 very time demanding and doesn't give you that time for reflection. Um, some of the other negativities were um, generally that kind of worrying about missing information. So what you're not seeing, obviously at the moment you can see me, you can only see a very small part of my house. You don't know what the rest of it looks like. You don't know, you know, kind of whether I'm kempt or unkempt. There's an awful lot of information you don't see and people very much worrying about what they're missing um, because of that. Um, so there, there's some real positives and real negatives. And I think the, the important thing is to think about there is no wrong, wrong and right answer. It's about what you have at the time. Some of the things we had in the tool was how long you might leave it before you visit somebody. Um, and, and also what, informa what information you have from other people, so other professionals and when they've seen somebody. Um, so there's a lot of information that you'd think about to help you make your decision to um, to actually work through when you, when you wouldn't need to go out on a home visit. Wonderful, wonderful. And and if we could just go back to um, to Jonathan as well, because that was just some um, content in the slides. I'm still organising people into rooms, so if you can talk a little bit more about the work, it's it's extra airspace for you really while we're together in the session. And my apologies, this is taking a little while. That's okay. Um, yeah, I think. Um, in terms of the the regional work which i thought was quite interesting i think each of the areas so you know in the northeast there's a, a number of us come together and we'd all been issuing guidance around how we'd expected our, our social work teams to 
I guess, to interact with people. In the very early days, it was very, very difficult. I think, as Alison mentioned in part of the presentation, you know, guidance was changing daily. Um, there was, I guess, a, a real fear factor around supporting people. And, you know, we know the work that we do, that there are essential visits that are required. There's no way of getting around that. We have to go and, uh, and see people. So I think we just brought the information together based on the feedback that we were getting within our areas um, around the fact that it would be really helpful to have something that was, um, I, I suppose, was 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 crossing over each of those areas so that we weren't doing completely different things. The defensible decision making title, I think, was really important because I think we did get to a point where, you know, at some point in the future, I'm sure people will look back and question some of the decisions that have been made around how we've we've worked in, in the profession. And I think that in itself was was something that we thought would be really helpful to have, you know, as Lynn showed in the presentation for the area that she's working in, you know, how we would have this information available um, so that it could be considered if there were questions that were asked about choices and decisions that were made during. Brilliant, Jonathan. Thank you. And just quickly back to Lynn, and then I think we're there. I'm making sure that we've got one of your um, facilitators in each room. Um, Lynn, just final word from you, and then we'll go into breakout rooms. Um, just to say that we've, our staff have found it really, really useful um, to just to, to unpick and record things. But I would, I would stress it's an extra tool. It doesn't replace talking to your manager or talking to other people. It's just a way to have in, in front of you if you are unsure whether to go or not. So it's it's not it's not mandatory, um, but it's something that a lot of our social workers are actually choosing to do, which they found you really useful. Brilliant. Right. Wonderful. Thank you all for talking a little bit more while I was organising in the background. Um, I'm going to press the button now. We're going to have around about 10 minutes of discussion and facilitation in each room, if that's OK, Alison. Yes. And then you'll bring us back into the main room, I, I will. take it. Um, and um, uh, we'll see you in the main room in about 10 minutes time. That's great, thank you. Pleasure. There's a bit of a delay and then you'll be taken into your respective rooms. So I'm going to hand back over to the speakers now um, and could facilitators in each group designated just give us a very quick sound bite as to the discussions? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Kate. So yeah, we hope you hope you managed and sorry about the technical problems, but hope you managed to have a good conversation. Um, so coming up into just in terms of feeding back, Lynn, I can see you on the screen. Do you want to give some feedback from your from your group? Um, yeah, we, we had a really good discussion um, and what we were saying that people tended to talk to the supervisor about whether or not to visit. Um, in, in some areas, they, they needed agreement from their director before they were allowed to go and do a face to face visit. Um, and then we were talking about the dual nature of the tool. So it kind of gives you permission to go or it justifies your your decision not to go. So we're talking about the duality of it, really. Um, and then we were talking about the vaccine and next steps and moving forward and how people were feeling a lot more confident how people are getting the vaccine. Um, but we also had the, a little talk about how it was important not to let your guard down. Um, because the risks of us going and spreading it among our, our client groups are still still very real. So although although we feel fine, um, there, there is a, a danger and we need to remember that. Thank you, Lynn. That's great. Um, Steph, do you want to come in and, and give your feedback from your group? Thanks, Alison. Um, obviously, a brief discussion, but, but again, really engaging. And I think some really nice examples of how um, using technology has enabled people to be involved, particularly in meetings in a way that they might not have been able to before. So not necessarily always around um, virtual visits, but absolutely how we can use that technology to um, better support clients to be involved in the process. Um, and a really good point made about the fact that as we come out of the pandemic, the defensible element of the decision making is going to be more crucial. So as we move into you know, using virtual visits, in a proactive rather than a reactive way, being clear about why we made that decision and that being a defensible decision is going to be really key. Thank you, Steph. And uh, Margaret, do you want to come to give some feedback from your group? Ah, yes, uh, there was a little bit of a technical hitch because Angela, the facilitator, was also in my group, so I don't know who <laughs> facilitated her group. But yeah, it was really interesting to find out that 
Um, other regions are using very similar tools as well, but in different ways. And I think what we talked about was the positives um, in enabling others to um, access through digital technology. And we didn't have quite have time to discuss that much further on the, about the negatives. But OK, so thanks, Margaret. And Jonathan, do you want to feedback on your group? Yes, thank you. So I, I guess, firstly, it felt like there was a bit of an acknowledgement that it has been difficult um, during this period. Talked a little bit about the issues that um, people with additional needs would have. So we talked a little bit about um, those people who may be deaf or, or deaf blind and actually how do you use the technology we have um, or the all the technology at, at our disposal rather than all of the technology that's available quickly to, to support people. I think there was a bit of a conversation about sort of um, you know possibly you know people who may be a bit older needing a little bit more time to adjust to um, to the use of technology rather than more traditional methods of, of, of contact. Um, also uh, somebody raised the issue of, um, of, of, of working remotely into care homes to complete mental capacity assessments and the challenge that that's presented, particularly with someone who may not quite understand you're there to assess their capacity. We also had the issues around technology itself um, and not, um, not everybody having a good signal for a start. So depending on where you live can often indicate there's some issues with that. Also, I guess not everybody having the right technology. So we as professionals may have been provided with the technology to work with people. And then we're trying to communicate with people who haven't been given any technology. So how how does that match up? And finally, a really good point about if if somebody's working with children and needs to know where that child or young person is, you can't necessarily identify that through a, a Zoom call. You could have a background on, you could be in a different room and it just makes things you know sometimes that little bit more difficult so thank you for the room I was in for for giving me that feedback so very quickly thanks Jonathan very quickly my, my group we talked about some staff training around staff confidence with using um, technology um, we also talked about um, people being more creative and um, one group, um, one, one, one person talked about in their area, they'd actually done a traffic light system for people. So sort of an amber, amber green system for who needed home visits and who, who didn't. So that was an interesting concept as well. Um, what we did say is that actually people felt quite reassured that we've all faced very similar issues um, and we've all kind of um, we've all had to kind of come up with some kind of solution to what those issues are. Um, so it's it's kind of. Not not rocket science, but it's reassuring that we've all kind of faced similar issues. So that was that was quite a positive thing. I'm conscious that there might be one other group that hasn't fed back because there was potentially one group without a facilitator. I don't know if anybody is happy to feed back if there was that group. Somebody's put their hand up. Um, that's me, actually, because oh, um, the the sixth group was the main room and it was just a very small group. So if anyone in that group, the group wants to to step forward, now's your chance just before we go into the exit and end the uh, intro. I think, to be fair, there was only a couple of us in that room and we talked about uh, a lot of the issues that you have already kind of raised through. Um, Main B, I think, I think the other lady in the group um, works for, um, I can't remember now. Oh, oh gosh, I got stage fright. Sorry. <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry. You you don't need to feel under any pressure at all. It was a. I think to be fair, it was it was how it's the benefits and, and, and advantages really the technology, but then how I mean I made a comment of you know in not visiting face to face that there's a lot that can be said in a visit that you don't say in words, so a lot can be missed and the danger of that. But actually, the benefits of the technology, um, I think the lady one I'm saying she supports. Uh, for one example, she gave was to support um, to assess um, sex offenders. And in, in, in terms of that, where ordinarily she wouldn't attend the property, but, um, you know, she could do that virtually through Zoom. So it, there are benefits in, in that. And this, this is a really useful tool. Wonderful. 
thank you, Rebecca. And um, we had a small group at the end because people kept dropping out of the um, the event and we had to readmit them. So apologies for that. But uh, the gremlins are against us. I'm conscious we need a final summary from Steph. But before we go, just to mention that Catherine is going to put um, a link to a survey for this session in the chat box. It takes a couple of minutes to, fit, to fill out just your thoughts and feedback on how this went today. That would be marvellous. This also constitutes a piece of CPD if you're a registered social worker like me and you've come along today. If you want to count today as a bit of your CPD for, for those purposes, you can. So without further ado I'll hand back to Steph to, to wind up um, no time for q and I'm afraid Steph but over to you to sort of to finish the finish the job off thank you and and just to say thank you to everybody for your comments and your, and your contribution so I'm Steph Downey I'm the service director for adult social care in Gateshead and also chair our northeast social work teaching partnership which I always have to get a bit of a mention in for um, so it's been a really great session this afternoon um, loads of questions about um, copies of the tools and the presentations and the video um, and absolutely we work with social work England to make sure that they're available we've committed in the northeast to continue working on this because as we've already said, we recognise that as we move out of the pandemic and all of the issues around social distancing, this tool will take on a different um, a different approach and a different phase. So we've committed to reviewing it, to, to sort of working um, either in our own local authorities or sub-regionally to see how we can evolve and develop it. And, and certainly for me, one of the really key things is to work with people with lived experience so that as we come out of the pandemic, we can really work with people who use our services to understand understand how they can benefit from virtual visits going forward. Um, but in closing, I'd just like to say thank you all very much for your contributions and attendance this afternoon. And please enjoy the rest of this week and whatever you've got planned for World Social Work Day. And on that point, I'll finally mention NESWA. Um, for anybody working in the Northeast in any of our local authorities or universities, we're running some sessions the week after World Social Work Day. So please find me on Twitter and get in touch and we can get you into any of those sessions some brilliant speakers. Thanks so much, Steph. Gosh, bang on time. That was a tight squeeze, wasn't it? And thank you from all of us at Social Work England for bearing with us with the IT glitches, uh, the breakout rooms and so on. It's been fascinating hearing about what you've been doing up in Gateshead. And we're, it's been a pleasure having you here as a contributor to this week's programme. So many, many thanks again to all of you who joined us. Hope you enjoyed it and see you all very soon. Take care of yourselves and bye bye. <laughs>